Hello everyone, good evening. So today we are having a free webinar on study FET on the topic of menopausal hormone therapy. Menopausal hormone therapy is a frequently asked topic and you can expect around uh, three to four questions from this topic uh, in your upcoming FET exam. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, therefore, is not an act, but an habit. So if you are used to uh, doing things repeatedly in a certain way or in the perfect way, you actually gain excellence. So this is what we always strive for in our day-to-day uh, -day lives. To, we strive for excellence, excellence in any field, in any whatever field we are choosing in our careers, okay? So excellence is something which we strive and we at Study Medic, we always strive so that we can be a part or we can help you where in your uh, pathway which uh, leads to success or excellence okay so fnb or this fet exam it is a qualifying exam for admission to the fellowship of national board that is the fnb uh, or the fnb postdoctoral courses so it, as far as ops gynae is concerned we have these two disciplines the one is reproductive medicine and maternal and fetal medicine these are the two courses uh, uh, which you can apply for uh, after uh, getting if you are lucky and you're getting through this fnb exam the other course is medical genetics but uh, it uh, it you can also apply for medical genetics that will be a different uh, the question paper is more or less yes you will be asked questions from ops and gynae plus there will be uh, the other uh, set of questions will be from medical genetics. So uh, FNB last year, they had plus four, minus one. Usually this is the exam pattern that they have. And uh, the question paper is 40% of the questions. They are from the eligible feeder speciality. That is the option gynae speciality. And around 60% of the questions, they are from the concerned fellowship uh, group of courses. That is if you are applying for reproductive medicine and maternal and fetal medicine, they will be asking you questions uh, from reproductive medicine and maternal and fetal medicine. So uh, you can uh, uh, you can now gather that, yes, you will be asked many questions from your obstetrics part, your high risk pregnancy part and from the reproductive medicine part. These are the these are mainly the uh, subspecialities or the subtopics which are being asked as far as your FNB is considered. Now, usually questions from the gynae oncology uh, are very few. From the gynae part, you can expect around uh, 20 or uh, 30 questions max. And mostly the questions are from the obstetrics part, around uh, 60 questions, uh, 50 to 60 questions from the obstetric parts and around 20 to 30 questions from the reproductive medicine part. So why choose us as, or why choose us uh, in your... Uh, pathway or in your course preparation why choose uh, study fnb as a partner to help you in this course preparation uh, you all know that study medic team has a robust experience prior where when mentoring the dnb mdms ob guides for the mrcog and the epgog exams and we uh, we are a dedicated team. So it is not a single mentor who is taking both the obstetrics as well as the gynae, gynae onco, as well as reproductive medicine and high risk uh, pregnancy, etc. So because you all are going to subspecialize, you should be knowing the importance of a subspeciality. It cannot be that a single mentor is well adapted to uh, that he or she can teach you all the streams. So this is the particular reason why we all are subspecializing because so that if you are subspecializing in a particular stream, naturally your niche or your niche of knowledge will be more in one particular subspeciality as compared to the other subspeciality. So this is what we are advocating to. We are asking our students to be subspecialists. So uh, naturally the mentors themselves need to be subspecialists also. So we have a dedicated team of subspeciality mentors who have subspecialized in different subspecialities of ops and gynae. And it's not a single mentor that is taking all the obstetrics, gynae and all the 
uh, or the reproductive medicine, oncology, and the high-risk pregnancy. It's not a single mentor effort. It's a team of mentors. And we have an ex uh, excellent IT support system and our LMS is backed up with, with various resources which will be useful for you in your FNB exam. So in our LMS source, we have we will be having interactive lectures, daily activity sessions with exam tested MCQs, flashcards and an intensive hour. Uh, in the intensive hour, uh, the thing that we do is the mentors themselves, they post questions and the questions, the whole syllabus is divided into uh, subtopics so that each subtopic you are able to uh, go through the questions for each subtopic. So we usually time it around nine o'clock, nine to ten o'clock where you can attend it in the telegram group and uh, the mentor will be posting you questions and you are answering them in case of any doubt you can clear it then and there and we have a dedicated 24 7 instant message support our mentors are uh, are available and you can directly message them and we are we strive for your success okay so it is a personalized attention that we want to give you students for in your path or in your success so that which will lead to success in the FNB exam. So we want each and every of our student to succeed. And it is not that a single student is getting and out of a whole lot of 100 students, we do not even know who the students are or we do not recognize the name of the students. It's not that. This is something where we want to give you a personalized attention. Attention to each and every student. Each and every student is made to feel at home like a family so that they get a personalized attention, okay? So recorded sessions will be provided to you. You are giving, a, you will be giving All India mock test and there will be an exam tested MCQ session towards the end of the session, which will uh, collect where we collect all the questions from the various last year papers because recalls are an integral part of any exam preparation and you uh, you can get a good number of questions from the recalls okay so this we also have an exclusively exam tested mcq session plus the exam tested mcqs are, have been updated in our lms and in our google drive which you will be able to access so in our resources, in our library, we have the recommended textbooks, Berek and Hacker, Williams, Orbs, Williams, Gaini. These are the two most important textbooks which you need to concentrate on while preparing for this FET. Uh, then Speroff is again a very important book for as far as FNB is concerned, Berek and Novak. Catherine Nielsen, PRC areas, these are important because they ask you a good lot of questions from your high-risk pregnancy part. Among the guidelines, yes, you need to go through the FIGO guidelines. ESHRE guidelines is very important. ESHRE ASRM guidelines are very important. The ACOG and the RCOG guidelines. The RCOG, the TOG articles, everything is backed up in our LMS. Uh, this uh, is our success story in our NEET SS exam. So we are proud to announce that rank number eight, Dr. Neeta was one of our students. Uh, Dr. Savita ranked 24. Dr. Priyanka Devi, she had a rank of 34. Dr. CC, she had a rank of 50. So these are some of the students who have ranked in our NEET SS September 2023 exam. Plus we have success stories in study INSS, gynae oncology, uh, both the consecutive batches, in both the consecutive batches, we have our students uh, who have topped the INISS gynae oncology batches. So we have this upcoming course of study FNB, which is scheduled to begin in November. So it is a, it is going to be a three month course uh, targeted to for the exam, possibly in February. There are rumors that the exam may be in February because last year also it was in February and till now no, Nat National Board of Examination has not uh, released any notification. So usually they release the notification a month before a month or two months before the exam. So you can expect the exam somewhere around February. So this is Dr. Upasna. I'm a budding gynecologist at a comprehensive cancer center. So uh, I usually take up the topics of oncology and gynae. Yes, oncology will be very less and it will be uh, very basic or very minimal, whichever, uh, how much you are is actually required in your FNB exam because they ask very simple and basic questions from FNB. So that will be dealt by me.
Uh, we have Dr. Nina. She has done her FNB in high risk pregnancy and perinatology and is presently working in UK. So she'll be taking the high risk pregnancy part of the FNB courses. And uh, we have Dr. Swati. She is a gold medalist working in Lucknow. She has also cleared her MRCOG. She will be also taking some of the sessions of the high-risk uh, pregnancy and the obstetrics part. Uh, Dr. Deepa Deepika, she has done her fellowship in uh, reproductive medicine. She'll be taking over the reproductive medicine sessions. So as I told you, it's going to be a team of mentors who are going to teach you. And we, every one of us, will strive so that our students succeed in the respective in the exams and uh, we uh, we believe that it is a personalized attention personalized attention that helps the students and not that uh, there is a whole lot of 100 students and the mentor doesn't know who the student is and we believe in uh, uh, our team effort and every mentor who has sub specialized in the in the respective field is going to teach you so we strive that yes uh, you should get specialized uh, attention and uh, whoever is the master of the particular stream or the particular subspeciality should be teaching you and not a single person is teaching you everything it cannot be that a single person can teach obstetrics as well as gynae as well as gynae oncology so that is exactly not the concept of giving this subspeciality exams okay so now if we do a past paper analysis of fnb so this is what we have found after we have we went through the last year's uh, recalls. So in obstetrics part, they have mainly concentrate on these topics like preeclampsia, preterm labor. They ask you many questions from preterm labor, cervical circlage, where, what is the indications, uh, CTG. They give you the CTG pictures. They have started giving you CTG pictures and what will be the management, what will be the next action, etc. Uh, diabetes mellitus, PPROM. So all these topics are usually from the uh, RCOG or the GTG guidelines. So GTG guidelines and the TOG articles, some of the TOG articles are actually very important for you. Now, medical disorders in pregnancy, usually they ask you questions from heart disease, infections in pregnancy, blood disorders in pregnancy, thromboembolism in pregnancy and puparia. Reproductive endocrinology is very essential for FNB. They ask you a number of questions from reproductive endocrinology, ovulation, physiology of menstruation. PCOD, ovulation induction, embryo transfer also are important topics. From oncology, very basic questions are asked, particularly pertaining to the staging. Yeah, this year, maybe they'll ask you a few questions pertaining to the FIGO 2023 endometrial cancer staging management, tumor markers, etc. So today uh, you had the INISS exam. So they did ask you questions from the FIGO 2023 endometrial cancer. So yes, that is a potential uh, question. It will be a potential question in your upcoming FET exam as well. Now coming to gynae onco, they uh, sorry, coming to gynae, they ask you uh, mainly the questions are from amenorrhea, the topic of amenorrhea, disorders of sexual differentiation. They'll give you a case scenario and ask you to identify what is the diagnosis or what will be the next management after you have identified the diagnosis. Then endometriosis is a, again a very important topic, the various types of classification of endometriosis, the management of endometriosis and the ISHRA guideline of endometriosis is very important. Remember for FNB, you need to cover all the ISHRA and the important ASRM guidelines. Contraception is again a very important topic which is frequently asked. In oncology, we'll be covering all the important topics. You are, So usually it's very basic. So we'll be keeping it basic. Only the basic part of oncology will be taken by me in uh, your uh, study FET courses. Uh, then in gynae also, we'll be covering the various aspects, as I told you, contraception, then amenorrhea, HRT, gynae infections, thromboprophylaxis, robotic is an upcoming branch, urogyne, so all these topics will be taken by me in the courses. Obstetrics will be covered, uh, the basics of obstetrics, labor, delivery, then your maternal pelvis, uh, abortion, early pregnancy related disorders, medical disorders of pregnancy, all this will be dealt in detail by Dr. Nina. Uh, the reproductive medicine, female reproductive endocrinology, male reproductive endocrinology, how to evaluate an infertile couple, the base, the various advances and ART, this will be taken by Dr. Deepika. 
So now coming to our topic at hand, that is menopause. So we all know menopause, uh, the median age of menopause is around 51 years and menopause is said to be occurred when there is cessation of menstruation for at least one year. So what is postmenopausal bleeding? Postmenopausal bleeding is any vaginal bleeding which is occurring after one year of cessation of menstruation, that is after one year of menopause. So we are tell every woman that wh whoever has any postmenopausal bleeding should report to the doctor and shouldn't uh, leave it unaddressed because it can be a potential cause for cancer. So for uh, FSH is the first gonadotrophin to increase and usually the levels are more than 50. The last hormonal marker to decrease is estradiol. So these are two important questions that FSH is the first one, first gonadotrophin to increase in case of menopause. And the last hormonal marker to decrease is estradiol. Hot flushes are the most common symptom of menopause and they occur in around 70 to 80 percent of the women. However, if you see women who are who are actually five years beyond menopause, then the incidence of hot flushes decreases to only tw around 20 to 30 percent. So hot flush is the immediate uh, first symptom of menopause, but however, its frequency decreases five years down the line. Osteoporosis, it affects one in three postmenopausal women and usually it is a type 1 osteoporosis and results in trabecular bone loss. So this is the straw, the famous, the straw stages that is minus 3 to minus 5. It is the reproductive stage. Minus 2 and minus 1 is the menopausal transition. 0 is the final menstrual period. Plus 1 and plus 2 is the postmenopausal phase. So this is how the uh, this is the actually straw is the stages of reproductive aging. So this is how uh, women passes through her uh, lifetime into the reproductive phase, menopausal transition, and then into the postmenopausal phase. So there are certain trials. Okay, they can ask you regarding the trials uh, regarding pertaining to menopause. So there are three important trials pertaining to menopause. The first was the HERS trial. So all these three, they are all randomized control trials. So randomized control trials are actually very, uh, have they have the most, eff uh, the most effective trials are the randomized control trial. So the HERS trial was the first randomized control trial, which tried to evaluate that whether giving HRT to a woman whether it prevents the occurrence or the recurrence of coronary heart disease in women with established coronary heart disease. So earlier it was thought that if we give all the postmenopausal women uh, estrogen plus progesterone containing replacement therapy, that is the HRT, maybe they will be protected uh, from this coronary heart disease, which the women are susceptible once they attain menopause because of the loss of the hormone estrogen. So however, they found that they it did not actually benefit or it did not prevent the recurrence of coronary heart disease giving hrt did not benefit or it did not prevent the recurrence of coronary heart disease however it did increase the risk of venous thromboembolism and gallbladder disease so what did they conclude they concluded that hrt should not be used for the secondary prevention in women with established heart disease so for just for preventing a uh, recurrence of uh, chd hrt should not be used so this is how these are the trials how the concept of HRT in women in menopause has evolved. Okay, so these were the foundation. These trials led to the foundation of the current concept of HRT in menopausal women. The second RCT, which, were, which was uh, published everywhere in the newspaper, was the Women's Health Initiative Study. So WHI or the Women's Health Initiative Study uh, was take, was undertaken to evaluate the effect of HRT on healthy postmenopausal women with a particular interest for cardiovascular outcomes. To till the WHI study, they had hoped that maybe HRT has a beneficial effect on the cardiovascular outcomes. But however, they saw that in 2003, the study arm has had to be closed prematurely because there was a uh, there was it was seen that there is a sudden surge of the detrimental effect so whenever you are doing a randomized control trial they always monitor regarding the 
effects of the trial because in case you see that you are actually randomizing the patients and giving them a therapy and it is actually doing more harm than benefit then you need to stop the trial midway so this is what happened in the whi study and they saw that there is an increase in breast cancer heart disease stroke and venous thromboembolism while there was a reduction in the fracture rate bowel cancer and diabetes Okay, so the, that's the reason why they again reanalyzed this whole thing where they had actually given the uh, given some women only estrogen containing therapy. So what they concluded from the WHI study is that HRT should be administered only for symptom relief during the early phase of menopausal transition which is now described as the window of opportunity. So now the dictum is while we are prescribing HRT to a postmenopausal woman is to give the lowest dose of HRT for the lowest duration possible. So HRT should not be given as a preventive measure for preventing cardiovascular disease, etc. It should be given only for the symptom relief. So it should be given for the lowest possible duration and with, with the lowest possible dose. First, you should start with the lowest possible dose and if uh, there the symptoms persist, then you can increase the dose. Then comes the million women study. So what was the million women study? This was a study conducted in UK. They actually took all the breast cancer patients who came, uh, sorry, they took all the breast, uh, the patients who were coming for the breast screening program. So that is where they took the, they enrolled the women and then they saw that there was a significant increased risk of breast cancer for women who were taking combined HRT. But however, the statistical design and the analysis of the study was criticized and it actually did not establish, the study was unable to establish that yes, taking HRT actually increases the risk of breast cancer was not, uh, was not uh, the causality or the actual uh, uh, causality of the uh, relation of HRT and breast cancer was actually not established by this million women study. So please note the, uh, the main important study was the WHI study. The million women study tried to establish a cause relation, causal relation with HRT and breast cancer. However, it has been heavily criticized. Now coming to the various types of HRT and what are the conditions where we can use it. So HRT can be given in the oral route, transdermal route, subcut route or the vaginal or the intrauterine route. There is something known as the domino effect of HRT. So what is the domino effect? Uh, if you are giving HRT only to treat the vasomotor symptoms, you can actually see that it also helps in the improvement of other symptoms of menopause so this is known as a domino effect so the domino it gives a domino effect that is one effect leads to benefit and other effects also okay so women who wish to stay on hrt for more than five years should be encouraged to switch to combined uh, hrt because to avoid an increased risk of endometrial hypoplasia which is seen in women going for sequential therapy so this is very important in case the women is going on continuing hrt usually the dictum is to give the lowest dose for the lowest duration but however if a woman is going on taking hrt for more than five years you should actually if she is on sequential hrt you should actually convert it to continuous combined hrt now coming to the various conditions and the type of HRT advocated, uh, that is in case of perimenopausal women with symptoms of menopause, you can go for continuous estrogen or cyclical progesterone where she can actually have some menstrual bleeding. Hysterectomized women, no need to give progesterone because this progesterone component of HRT is actually uh, correlated with the increased incidence of breast cancer. So go only for estrogen only in case she is a hysterectomized woman. In case of postmenopausal women who are actually complaining of low libido, you can go for tibolone because tibolone is a steer. It is a steer compound. It has estrogenic, androgenic effects. So it actually helps in libido. Uh, can anyone tell me which is the FDA, uh, which is the FDA approved HRT, which is actually an FDA approved HRT in cases of uh, low libido? There is uh, a drug which is actually approved by the FDA for in cases of low libido. This is an important question for your upcoming exam. 
The answer is ospemifen. Okay, ospemifen. We'll be talking about the drug later. So, put in cases of potential malabsorption, it can be a non-oral route. You can go for a non-oral route. In case of older women, you can start with the lowest dose and can adjust the dose. And in case of early menopause, you may need, may require higher estrogen dose. So, because in the uh, just if the patient has just had a menopause then you may need to give her a higher estrogen dose for to combat her symptoms. Now, these are the various regimens of this uh, of your uh, HRT. That is, you can go for a continuous estrogen regimen. That is where if she has no uterus or you can go for the sequential therapy where you give estrogen up to day seven and then you give progesterone from uh, for the next 14 days and then give a seven day break. And cyclical HRT, that is continuous, continuous sequential HRT can be given. That is estrogen you are giving throughout and progesterone you are adding for the last 14 days. So this is a sequential therapy. So sequential therapy, however, there is no tablet break. So there is uh, you get regular bleeding at the end of the cycle. So this is continuous sequential HRT, which is advocated by some of the doctors. However, uh, the most safe variety is the continuous combined HRT in case the uterus is intact. That is, you give estrogen and progesterone without any tablet break. So in this case, usually you do not have any bleeding. In continuous sequential HRT, the women may experience bleeding. So that bleeding that is also poor, that is not known as postmenopausal bleeding because this bleeding is a consequence of continuous sequential HRT. Now coming to the different uh, MHTs which are available in India, the only available MHT in India is 17 beta estradiol and didrogestrone. So in perimenopausal or in premature uh, ovarian insufficiency, here you need uh, at least one milligram of estradiol, two milligram is ideal and the duration of treatment for uh, POI is still the natural age of menopause. This is very important. This uh, has been asked in the exam, what will be the duration of treatment or how long will you give hormone therapy to this patient? It will be till the natural age of menopause. This is a very important question. This is actually a very easy question. But still, uh, there are some easy questions which are asked in the exam. So in case of postmenopausal women, you give one milligram of estradiol plus five milligram of didrogestrone. So this is in the form of continuous combined uh, menopausal hormonal therapy. Now coming to the duration, yes, in case of premature ovarian failure, remember that you need to start HRT within one year of premature menopause and you should continue it till the age of 40 years or till natural age of menopause. It is better if you continue it till the natural age of menopause. Now, in case you are giving for, as a symptom relief measure for hot flashes, then the minimum dose with the minimum duration, as I told you, this is the dictum. Ideally, not more than one year. It is usually required not more than one year and you should initiate not before six weeks of treatment. And... Uh, in case of uh, as a professional opinion for HRT or at or after, it is usually not given routinely. Uh, it is an optional and there is very limited uh, duration that without any symptoms, you are actually prescribing HRT that is not usually done. In case a patient has symptom, then you need to give her HRT for the lowest dose for the lower for the minimum duration. Now coming to some of the contraindications, this is again a very important thing which is asked in the exam. What are the relative contraindications of HRT? Existing cardiac disease, active liver disease, systemic lupus erythematosus, previous breast cancer, previous ovarian or endometrial cancer, undiagnosed vaginal bleeding, previous personal or family history of venous thromboembolism. So these are the relative contraindications. These are due to the estrogen and cancer. Uh, the previous breast, breast cancer is a very uh, important contraindication of hormone replacement therapy. So which are the cases where you should go for a transdermal route of HRT? These are personal in case the patient actually prefers. That is all obviously a, uh, uh, an indication. Then migraine in case of migraine, diabetes, uh, controlled hypertension, existing gallbladder disease, hyperlipidemia, obesity, smoking, previous venous thromboembolism, varicose vein. So in such conditions, you need to go for transdermal because it actually reduces the systemic absorption so that 
the amount of side effects with this HRT is decreased or minimal. Now coming the menopause, now coming to the type of treatment or the type of HRT you give in case of the menopausal symptoms. So we have already discussed that HRT is given in case of uh, menopause only in case you have a symptom. Earlier we used to give HRT as a preventive measure for various conditions but however now the indications have changed after the advent of the trials. So in case the patient has come to you and she is suffering from hot flushes, the first line of treatment, this has been asked in your NETSS exam as well as in the FET exam that what is the first line treatment of hot flushes? The answer is always lifestyle ma management or non-hormonal treatment. They are the first line treatment. In case they fail, then you go for menopausal hormone therapy or the HRT. So what are the non-hormonal treatments available? They are SSRIs, that is venlafaxin, paroxetine, etc. Gabapentin, pregabalin, these are the various non-hormonal treatments which are available. However, you should remember that if a patient is in having tamoxifen, you cannot give paroxetine. So all the drug interactions and all you need to remember. Genitourinary syndrome of menopause. Here, uh, also, you have the first line management is uh, lifestyle management and non-hormonal treatment with vaginal moisturizers, lubricants, local estrogen. And as I told you, ospemifen is actually in the FDA approved drug for genitourinary syndrome of menopause or in case of uh, low libido, etc. You can give ospemifen 60 milligram per day. It has to be used in caution in case you are prescribing to a lady with estrogen positive cancer usually the breast cancers are estrogen uh, pr receptor they can be erpr receptor or there can be certain uh, cancers like uh, your um, uh, endometrial stromal sarcoma etc which are estrogen positive cancers now coming to bone health for bone health raloxifen 60 milligram per day tamoxifen both of them they are estrogen agonist in the bone so they help to protect the bone health Potential malabsorption, here you need to go for a non-oral route. In case of older women, you start with the lowest dose and then adjust the dose. And in case of early menopause, you may need to start for a with a higher estrogen dose. So, uh, menopausal as per the NCCN also, menopausal hormone therapy is the most effective way for the management of uh, vasomotor symptoms. So please remember the difference. If the question is asked that which is the most effective way of management, then the answer will be hormonal replacement therapy. In case the question has asked that which is the first line of management for vasomotor symptoms, the answer will be non-hormonal uh, treatment that is the SSRIs or it can be lifestyle modification if lifestyle modification is one of the options. So, the general recommendations are always to use the lowest dose possible to come uh, to control the symptoms. Relative contraindications we have already discussed that is the history of hormonally mediated cancers that is high risk endometrial and most of the breast cancers. Any history of abnormal vaginal bleeding it needs to be investigated so you cannot just give hormones to the patient. Active or recent history of thromboembolic event, pregnancy and active liver disease. So these are the relative contraindications of HRT. You need to use caution while giving HRT in case of survivors with coronary heart disease or hypertension or if they have increased genetic risk for cancer like BRCA1 or 2 or Lynch syndrome and current smokers especially uh, over 35 years. So now we'll come to the indication of HRT in the respective gynae cancer. So where can you give HRT if a cancer patient comes to you or a gynae cancer patient comes to you where HRT can be given? So in case of uterine cancer, in case she is an early stage endometrial cancer, you can give her HRT. HRT is acceptable as seen in various studies. So these are very small studies or retrospective studies because it's very hard to do or RCT in such uh, in such cases. Uh, so in case of early stage endometrial cancer and the patient has uh, postmenopausal symptoms, you can give her HRT. Now coming to advanced endometrial cancer, these are usually hormone receptor positive. So here in such case, H HRT is not recommended. So please remember in early stage, it is recommended. In advanced stage, it is not recommended. Uterine sarcoma, likewise, as I told you, endometrial stromal sarcoma, leomyosarcoma, they are usually, they respond to estrogen 
uh, stimulation. So the uh, HRT is again not recommended. Now coming to ovarian cancer. In ovarian cancer, high-grade serous ovarian cancer, HRT is acceptable. Uh, but in case of low-grade serous, which is again hormone-responsive cancer and endometrioid ovarian cancer, HRT is not recommended. Coming to cervical cancer, it is squamous cell carcinoma or adenocarcinoma. Here, uh, you can safely give her HRT. Now, this is again a very important slide because in case of BRCA mutation, in case the patient is BRCA 1 or 2 positive, but she herself has no personal history of breast cancer. Please remember, she must not have any personal history of breast cancer. In such a case, you can safely give her HRT. There, there is no problem in giving HRT to a BRCA1 or 2 women because such women and most BRCA1 or 2 women, we may need to do a risk-reducing salping ophorectomy because they have uh, risk-reducing salping ophorectomy actually decreases the incidence of ovarian cancer by around 96%. So, in BRCA1 and 2 positive uh, women, we go for RRSO. So, post RRSO, these women, usually RRSO is recommended at the age of 40 years in BRCA1 and in BRCA2, it can be delayed up to 45 years. So, these women uh, come to us with postmenopausal symptoms at an age of 40 or 45. So, they still have 10 years left. So, in such a case, you can safely give her HRT in case she herself does not have breast cancer. So this is a very important uh, topic and a very important question for your ex upcoming exam. So please remember this. In case of BRCA mutation with a personal history of breast cancer, if she herself has breast cancer, if the patient has breast cancer, in such a case, HRT is not recommended. If the woman has breast cancer plus she has BRCA1 or 2, in such a case, HRT is not recommended. In case of Lynch syndrome, which predisposes to endometrial, ovarian and colon cancer, in such a case, you can safely give her HRT. Okay, so is there any question? Yeah. If we use HRT in postmenopausal women with fibroid, there is increase in size of fibroid or not? Same question, but use of HRT in postmenopausal with endometriosis okay so in case of hrt in fibroid usually the fibroid does not increase with uh, in size with the use or uh, in postmenopausal women uh, we do not address fibroids because the fibroid does not increase in size okay so there has not been any reports or i have not seen any studies where hrt actually increases the size of a fibroid or it is contraindicated if, in case the woman is suffering from fibroid or endometriosis usually as we read in the absolute contraindication part it is breast cancer Okay, in breast cancer, it is absolutely contraindicated because it can increase the risk of breast cancer recurrence or metastasis or recurrence in the other breast. So, as far as fibroid is uh, fibroid and endometriosis is concerned, use of HRT does not increase the size of fibroid or, or increase endometriosis. Okay, so hope it is clear. Now coming, this is a beautiful chart. So please remember this chart regarding HRT and gynae cancer. So where do you use HRT? In case of endometrium, low risk and early stage, it is actually safe as we have discussed in low risk and early stage endometrium. Sorry, I'm so sorry. So in low risk and early stage endometrium, uh, HRT is safe. In high risk, early stage endometrium, you have to use extreme caution and you need to wait for 6 to 12 months after adjuvant treatment. In advanced stage, you need to avoid HRT. And in case of Lynch syndrome, you can safely give HRT. So this is something we have already discussed. Now coming to sarcoma. In sarcoma, you need to check the ERPR status. Better is to avoid. In case of stump, ERPR negative, you can give HRT with caution. Cervix, vulva, vagina, you can give. It is safe. In ovary, in high-grade serous, you can give. In low-grade serous, you need to apply caution because they are hormone-responsive. Borderline tumor, you can give. 
germ cell tumors you can safely give sex cord stromal again you can give however you have to use it with caution in case of granulosa cell tumor because again they are hormone responsive tumor so this is a very important chart and uh, this is a very important upcoming topic about gynae cancer and the use of HRT. So this topic is both from your oncology as well as your gynae part. So this is a potential exam question in your upcoming FNB exam. Now coming to the Stockholm and the Habits trial. These are again a very important trial related to hormone replacement therapy in cases of breast cancer. So in breast cancer, the Stockholm and the Habits trial, they were also prematurely terminated. They showed that there is a significant increase in risk of uh, breast cancer if in case the women are taking HRT. So as we already mentioned, uh, uh, giving HRT in a breast cancer women is strictly no. Okay, so never give a HRT if the woman herself has a history or has a personal history of breast cancer. However, the Liberate trial, it showed that there is a higher risk of uh, breast cancer recurrence in case of estrogen positive breast cancer who were on aromatase inhibitor. There was no difference in SCRM treated, that is if the patients were on tamoxifen or in estrogen negative patients, there was no difference in the uh, in the incidence of breast cancer, okay, and HRT. So what should we do in this breast cancer patients? Now, because we cannot give breast cancer patients HRT, so what should be, what is the solution? What should we do then? So they will also have postmenopausal symptoms, so that should be a solution for them. So in cases of mild symptom, you need to give her some lifestyle modification like exercise, you adjust the room temperature or do some dietary adjustment, reduce the body weight, reduction of body weight helps in everything. Relaxation, yoga, deep breathing exercises, vaginal moisturizer, lubricants, etc. In case of moderate, you may need to give her SSRIs or SNRIs, antidepressants. In case of severe, you can give short-term medroxyprogesterone acetate or SCRM or you uh, for bone uh, for bone health you can give her zoledronic acid that is what we are we give our breast cancer patients that is zoledronic acid for her bone health or bisphosphonates or denosumab denosumab we give in case the creatinine there is any dysfunction any derangement in her creatinine clearance or in her uh, renal function then we give otherwise we go first first line of management is always bisphosphonate in case there is any derangement then we go for denosumab because it is more costly so usually uh, bisphosphonates are preferred first line. So women with a history of breast cancer and taking tamoxifen should avoid SSRIs. As I told you that uh, paroxetine should not be given along with tamoxifen. Where if a woman is in tamoxifen for breast cancer, you should not give a paroxetine because there is considerable drug interaction. Now clonidine and gabapentin can be taken in case of tamoxifen users. So to summarize our today's session, so you need to identify the indication of menopausal hormone therapy, whether you are giving her this HRT for as a symptom relief measure or uh, for premature ovarian insufficiency. And whatever be the cause, it should be for with the it should be given in the lowest dose for the lowest possible duration. And whenever you are giving her HRT, you should monitor the women for any related side effects. You should tailor the therapy according to the type of cancer and that sh uh, women should be thoroughly cancer counseled in case you are giving HRT to a woman who has a hormone dependent cancer. And the risk benefit ratio should be, uh, should be properly looked into in case you are actually giving HRT to a woman who has a hormone positive cancer and lifestyle changes and non-hormonal methods, they are also very important. Okay. So they are also very important in our while you are giving MHT to the patient. Now we'll always, uh, so this is something which we do in our sessions also, that first we cover the session and then we discuss some questions. So today we, I have two questions for you. So please try and answer. Both are easy questions, but uh, so it is the easy questions which actually help you uh, mark your answers and come out successful in the exam. So yes, so which of the following is true regarding the hormonal profile of a woman uh, during menopause?
Okay, Asima is uh, tells me that it is C. The answer is B. FSH increases, inhibin decreases, as well as AMH decreases. The answer is B, not C. Okay, I hope it's clear. In case of menopause, FSH increases as we discussed. Inhibin also decreases, AMH also decreases. There is no ovarian reserve in menopause, right? So both of them decreases. The answer is B, not C. Yes, yes, yeah. So you should, you are not allowed to miss out on such easy questions. So this happens during our exam also. So it is practicing and practicing the MCQs, which helps us get past these errors. So these errors in such easy questions, you are not actually allowed to make uh, such mistakes if you are actually uh, competing for such uh, exams where there are very limited number of seats okay so please try to practice this comes with practice uh, where you do not uh, make such uh, silly errors because i am sure you all must be knowing this so this is what happens in menopause there is follicular depletion so the inhibin level decreases the granulosa cells are less so the estradiol level decreases this is the last hormonal marker amh level also decreases and the progesterone levels are also less so which of the following synthetic progesterone is not structurally related to testosterone this uh, question was not asked in the FET exam but i included this question because this is from the recent tog article from just the recently published talk article. So this is a potential topic which can be asked in your exams. So any idea which of this progesterone is not related? Okay, Asima tells D. Uh, actually, the answer is C, magistral acetate. Okay, so we all know progesterones, progestins and progesterone. These three terminologies, they are actually used interchangeably. And we think that all these three terminologies actually mean the same thing. But actually, the three terminologies are different. So what is progesterogens? Progesterogens is the collective term for all hormones with progesterone receptor activity, including both natural progesterogen and progestins. That is the synthetic progesterogens. What is progesterone? Progesterone is the natural steroid hormone, which is produced from the corpus luteum. And what is progestins? Progestins are the synthetic progesterone-like progesteroid hormones that have similar activity to the endogenous uh, progesterone, which is produced by the corpus luteum. And they can also activate the progesterone receptor. These progesterogens, they mimic the activity of progesterone, but can also act on estrogen, androgen, glucocorticoid, and mineralocorticoid receptors. So I think it's now clear to you. So progesterone is the natural hormone. Progestin, they are synthetic hormones, whereas progestogens, it's a, it is both progesterone plus progestin. So both the natural plus the synthetic variety combined together is known as progestogens. Okay, so this is the difference between the three. So now coming to this important table, this is again a very important table. So synthetic progestogens, they can be structurally related to progesterone or structurally related to testosterone. So synthetic progestogens, that is the progestins. So progestins, it can be structurally related to progesterone or testosterone. So the question asked, which of the following did not relate to testosterone? So we see uh, that magistral acetate, it is derived from the pregnant, uh, pregnant group. So MPA, medroxyprogesterone acetate, magistral acetate, ciproterone acetate, they are actually derived from pregnancy and they are not related to testosterone. So ciproterone acetate is actually a drug which we give in hirsutism. Now, didogesterone, medrogesterone, they are also related to pregnancy. And your nomagestrol acetate, nestron, dimagestron, these are all 19 not pregnancy. No need to remember in detail. Just remember these important drugs that will do because they'll ask you uh, questions only from the commonly used uh, compounds of progesterone, not the ones which is not very commonly used, okay? Now, structurally related to testosterone, we have norethisterone acetate, tibolon, ethinodiol diacetate, levonorgestrel, desogestrel, gestodine, and in non-ethinylated derivatives, we have dinogest and rosperinone. So both of the dinogest and rosperinone, they are actually related to testosterone. So please remember this. 
and let me know in case you have any questions we always try to get back to you and uh, you can directly message me in case you have any doubts regarding anything so all the best all the best for your upcoming exams and your upcoming preparation and thank you thank you for attending the session thank you so much